Situated along the Kimberley's eastern boundary is Miama National Park, or Hidden Valley as it's also known. A rocky massif of sandstone weathered into a maze of small canyons that echo with birdsong. The dome-like formations are reminiscent of a much larger attraction a little way to the south called the Bungle Bungle. Hidden away in Hidden Valley is quite an interesting resident worthy of discussion. This structure is a Chateau de Amour belonging to a creature called the Greater Bower Bird. Now aside from a rather striking patch of pink feathers at the back of his head, he's a rather drab looking creature with an obnoxious rasping voice. He makes up for these misgivings, however, by weaving this intricate bower and decorating it with whatever artefacts he can find that he thinks will make this place look great. You'll find rounded river stones, egg rings, plastic bottle caps, pieces of different coloured glass arranged in, their, in colour coordination, even a measuring spoon. This is not a nest. This is where the wooing, the seduction, and hopefully the misdealings occur with the female bowerbird. When she arrives, she'll come down to inspect the property, the decorations, and him. If she approves, mating will take place. She'll then leave, build a nest, lay her eggs, and raise those young on her own. In the meantime, the males stay here, attending the bower, and awaiting a new suitor. He's just arrived. I think he's going to get very angry. In fairness, the male bowerbird is a rather accomplished mimic, though his regular voice is like fingernails on a chalkboard. Our friend is extremely diligent in his duties. Even an errant leaf must be removed. But what fate awaits for an intruder? Things will not go so well is my prediction. The eastern gateway to the Kimberley and largest town north of Broome is Kununurra. This community is relatively new, established in 1961 to service the Ord River scheme. This involved damming the Ord River for irrigation of over 117 square kilometers of farmland consisting of fruit, vegetables and sandalwood. The initial dam was completed in 1963 and a second one, farther upstream called the Top Dam, holds back Lake Argyle. Australia's largest man-made lake. Lake Kununurra sits right above the first dam wall and at the doorstep of the town, a perfect setting for an afternoon boat ride in the interceptor. Even before the first dam was built, this stretch of water was held in place by a natural rock bar. Dense vegetation lines the banks, giving the place a distinctively fishy look. It's not long before something takes a bite at a passing lure. The culprit turns out to be a lumbering catfish, destined to be returned to the water. A snake-necked darter watches us suspiciously as yet another stinker takes a woolly bugger on the end of the fly rod. After a good solid battle, our slimy friend is to be cast back to the watery depths. With no further joy, we set back to base to ready ourselves for the next adventure. Below that big wall is the Lower Ord, where things can get a lot more interesting. There are horrible places in the world, and the Ord River ranks high amongst them. This nightmarish body of water carves its way up towards Wyndham and is jam-packed with nastiness. It would be near impossible to drown in the Ord River Something big and scary would eat you long before your body succumbed to suffocation. At this point along the river, both species of crocodile coexist with what appears to be a measure of harmony. We find ourselves a spot to set up camp a safe-ish distance from the river. This is all prime habitat that favors the agile wallabies and they are in near plague proportions. It's also cattle country, 
The Brahmins are a preferred breed, reportedly able to deal better with the sweltering tropical conditions and more resistant to ticks. The necessity for water brings the locals riverside to drink. This, however, brings about its own set of perils. There are some very big crocodiles inhabiting these waters. This fellow might not be in as much danger as it appears, though. It's the ones you don't see that are the real threat. The vegetation along the banks is home to the restless flycatcher and the redback fairy wren. This is our first sighting of the buff-sided robin, a critter neither of us knew existed. And, of course, the magnificent rainbow bee-eater. A true gem along the water's edge is the brilliantly colored azure kingfisher, a tiny bird dwarfed by its much larger cousin, the kookaburra. In amongst the trees are some very noisy occupants. Too much even for this wallaby. We're here amongst a bunch of fruit bats, also called flying foxes. Now, they roost in these big colonies, usually along the river like we are now. Despite the sound of it, they come here to get rest because at night they take off in the thousands. If you look up at dusk, you can see that the sky is just littered with them. And it's at that point that they travel vast distances looking for food. Conveniently by this little free camp is a boat ramp, so it's time to launch the interceptor. The Ord has more dangers than just crocs and sharks. It is quite shallow in places and has lots of submerged snags. The variety of wildlife continues to impress as flocks of magpie geese erupt from their roosts. Oh, look at the croc. There seems to be no end to the number of big, sinister lizards along the banks. The glossy ibis probes for food in the muddy shallows and takes a break for a good scratch. We also encounter a black-fronted dotterel and a masked lapwing, even a small croc in a tree. We're seeing a lot of evidence the river is well stocked with fish, so Wilms works the edges, but to no avail. Our presence disturbs a band of brolgas hanging out on the beach, and a ways downstream is a black neck stork trying to do the same thing we are. Commonly called a jabiru, this name has in fact already been claimed by the South Americans for a similar bird native to that continent. We decide for a quieter approach and drift with the current, which does get results. Despite witnessing a huge barramundi earlier, it seems that catfish might be the Ord's only fish inclined to take a hook. A dirty old stinker. There we go. Our drift begins to take us in the direction of something sinister. So we decide to fire up the engine and move on. However, something goes a little wonky. With the engine not wanting to cooperate, we are well aware of others becoming interested in our predicament. We've had a bit of an issue with the motor, so Mr. Foreman here is uh, using a bit of manpower to get us back home. Croc infested waters, engine problems, calling away home. I think we might have further to go than what we thought. That's why you should always, if you've got a dodgy motor, go upstream, then you can drift home. Not only with the wind sometimes, but with the current, instead of pushing against both. You doing okay? Oh, I think so. Try, try the motor. Maintenance is a good thing when done right. And earlier today I cleaned out the fuel filter. It's time to check my work. I find the rubber seal is kinked, causing the engine to draw in air and not fuel. Correcting my incompetence sees with a few heaves on the cord, the interceptor's motors roar to life, and as good as new. We slowly make our way towards home, the surface of the water turbulent with the swirls and splashes of fish, moving clear as we motor over the weed beds. As the day draws to its conclusion, so does our excursions upon the Ord. 
Night lays claim over the land and creatures of the darkness emerge to conduct their nightly business in the shadows. We've somewhat been accustomed to much cooler and bug-free environments than what we have here, and me with a toothache. We're both having a rough start to the morning and feeling a little grumpy. But it's very important to remember that there are other people that are having much rougher days than you. Keep that in mind. We're going to meet one right now. Come along, Wilms. Now, this guy's having a really bad day. Just keep that in mind. Next time, feeling a little grumpy. Several hundred kilometres south from the junction between Wyndham and Kununurra is the turnoff to Pernalulu National Park. The unpaved public access road is only 50 kilometres long, but rough and can take up to three hours. By now the hour is late and the colours of the Kimberley glow as the sun begins to set. There are a number of water crossings to negotiate on the way in and like so many Kimberley attractions, this means roads are cut off in the wet season. It becomes a bit of a race to reach our destination before dark, and from a distance we do manage to catch a glimpse of our objective, the mighty Pernalulu Massive. The following morning, we drive to the southern boundaries of the range to begin our exploration. It's here that the park's most distinctive features are to be found. Thousands of enormous black and orange banded domes that tower over a flat landscape of spinifex and shrubs. These geological wonders are part of an enormous block of sandstone heavily dissected with gorges, gullies and slot canyons. The relatively fine grains that make up the sandstone in the southern part contrasts greatly with the conglomerate of boulders to be found farther north. Pernalulu is an Aboriginal word simply meaning sandstone, but the park is more commonly called the Bungle Bungle. At least three separate theories exist for the origin of the name, which means that no one really knows. Despite the incredible beauty, this park was only brought to the world's attention in 1983 by a documentary crew. It became a national park in 1987, with a World Heritage listing in 2003. We set off on a seven kilometre return walk into the range to a tributary of Picaninny Creek, the main watercourse flowing from the Bungle's southern flanks. Wandering amongst the domes provides clues to the ancient processes involved in the creation of what exists today. The orange and black banding that you see on the domes in the southern part of the park are a thin protective skin over the soft white rock beneath. The orange is oxidisational rust and the black is a cyanobacteria. This protects the soft rock underneath. If you remove it, rapid erosion will happen, severely damaging the domes. Other points of interest are the castles built up high on the stone by grass-eating termites, accessed by little mud-hardened passageways to the ground below. And in the main watercourse, Circular holes carved out by swirling river rocks during the turbulent flows of the wet season. Once the trail branches away from the dry rocky river, we find ourselves in a narrow passage beneath the imposing domes of the bungles that eventually leads us into a huge open vault called Cathedral Gorge. During the rains, water runoff cascades into this massive chamber with a chilly pool that lasts long into the dry season. Areas like this should be sanctuaries for native wildlife, but here we make a terrible discovery. Crammed into every nook and cranny are giant toads. This hulking monstrosity is a cane toad, a South American native introduced to Australia back in the 1930s to combat the cane beetle. Unfortunately, it was not overly effective and has since has spread right across top end Australia. It's now hit the Eastern Kimberleys and down here into the Bungle Bungles where it's just arrived. They're highly toxic with these venom glands behind the shoulder and will kill dead snakes, monitor lizards, birds and any mammals that happen to eat them. 
their arrival is a catastrophe. In addition to the living specimens are hundreds of mummified carcasses. Their demise may have occurred by natural causes, though some evidence points to human involvement. There's no denying that the cane toads are a scourge on Australia, and the species itself has to be eradicated. That said, each individual is still a living being and probably deserve to be euthanized humanely. So you've got a couple options. One, bag it up yourself and freeze it, they'll die. Or a lot of the parks have a receptacle bin where you can put live ones in and leave the job to somebody else. Now I'd be thinking conventional methods of killing cane toads, such as slamming them with rocks and hitting them with golf clubs, may not be considered humane. Also, the carcasses are generally left behind, and that means it's not such an effective method. In my understanding, a dead cane toad, at least in the short term, is nearly as lethal as a living cane toad. It's not long before we are joined by a group of fellow travellers trudging in from the furnace without, to rest on the cool rocks and enjoy the serenity with a cup of tea and a biscuit. As for me and Wilms, we're heading north. It's a very slow 30 odd kilometre drive to the northernmost car park, which gives access to a couple of hikes into the range for closer inspection. The stroll into Mini Palms begins by following a dry creek bed, a popular haunt for a variety of small birds. Once in the refuge of the gorge, we walk in the shade of a thick grove of Livestonia palms. Rock figs somehow manage to squeeze their roots into the small cracks in the quest for moisture. Things get a little more rough farther in, requiring some scrambling over boulders comprised of what appears to be well-rounded granite and basalt stones cemented together like plums in a pudding. The trail emerges briefly into an open arena enclosed by big red walls and sneaks off down a random offshoot to a stairway and a viewing platform. Here we overlook a swampy little patch in a grotto. This is where the bonsai-like mini palms are found and is now off limits. As it appears, many have vanished beneath the heavy footfalls of tourism. Following this dry creek bed back into the range is a truly remarkable journey that leads the explorer into a slot canyon called Echidna Chasm. Once again protected under a canopy of palms, the walls of rock quickly close in to become narrow passageways between cliff faces hundreds of meters high, where palms cling precariously to the steep sides. The chasm has been cut by water over time that has exploded natural fracturing in the stone caused by ancient uplift. The final section is up a step ladder to the end of the track and time to ponder how this all came to be. The birth of the bungles begins here in this savage ancestral mountain range far to the north of where the park will eventually be. Under the relentless assault of the elements, huge quantities of rock, mud, sludge and shit has been stripped from the slopes and washed away in powerful river systems. Rubble and boulders have worn down pebbles smooth as they're tumbled along for vast distances by the force of the water. Eventually, these rivers lose some of their momentum and the larger rocks are deposited. As one progresses further from the source, the rock size gradually becomes smaller until at the end of these massive alluvial flats, only the finest sediments come to rest. Seasonal variation in the force of these rivers is evident in this cross section of rock. Over the years, elemental forces weather these ancestral mountains to nothing. But by then, the sediments of what is to become the bungles has been laid out many hundreds of meters thick. Even then, more dirt is laid over top, and under this enormous weight, the sediments are compacted into stone. A little later, more turbulent events occur as powerful earth movements shake the region. Pernalulu's foundations, still buried at this point, is buckled and deeply fractured in such a way as if viewed from above, it could look like a big block of chocolate. Now as things quieten down a little, the sculpting powers of erosion set to work. 
Huge quantities of topsoil is cut away by the rivers and the rains and blown away by the winds until the rock of the Bungle Bungle is now revealed. These harder stones prove more resistant to erosion and as the ground level lowers, they appear to grow from the earth. The rock of Pernalulu cannot stay the effects of wind and water forever and as the blocks emerge, their corners are rounded off creating domes and the fractures are cut into deep slot canyons and gorges. And so after millions of years of erosion, Mother Nature has crafted for us this marvellous tourist attraction. And so comes to an end our western walkabout. A grand adventure, yet just a fraction of the wonders held within this vast state of the Australian continent. There is no doubt most of us take for granted the endless space and freedom we have here. Yet all of us must have noticed the changes over the years. As the world begins to overflow with humanity, Western Australia is already getting busy. Excellent vehicles are more easily obtained. Roads are getting better, yet access is being restricted to protect what we have left. It falls on us all to be custodians of this magnificent state to travel as lightly as we can and nurture the fragile wilderness that is WA. I encourage all my fellow countrymen, next time you're out in the wilds, crack open a cold one, sit back and marvel at the wonders in our own backyard. Well, I'm afraid that concludes Western Walkabout, but don't fret, we've got more coming for you. We aren't finished with Australia by any means. However, in the near future, we're going to be taking you to the diverse and believe it or not, wild continent of North America. We'll be going to places like Yellowstone, the Allagash Waterway, Death Valley, and the Mojave Road, plus many others. Mr. Foreman and I also wanted to take this chance to thank all of our amazing viewers. Without you, we wouldn't be making these, well, okay, let's be honest, yes, we would, but it's a lot more fun having you along for the journey. Thank you for all your likes, your comments, your support, and even inspiration for future episodes. It's also a big help when you like, share, and subscribe. Thank you so much. We'll see you soon. Till next time.